Do not try this at home. If you're a regular on this channel, you'll know I just got this mini mill uh, just a couple weeks ago. If you're not, well, I still got this mini mill just a couple weeks ago. One of the things that I've had trouble with is drilling. When I first got it, I tried to drill out a broken off stud in the head, and I had to go extremely slow because it kept overloading. Yesterday, I tried to drill into some plate steel. It kept overloading. Tried to drill on this, kept overloading. Even a center drill, just a, a simple center drill would get this thing so that it would overload and stop. This uh, light turns on yellow when it's been overloaded. And so I did a test here and take a look at this. Under no circumstances should you do this with any other lathe. But watch. Yeah, I just grabbed the spindle and overloaded it with my bare hand. And I mean, I did, that wasn't like I was trying, right? That was barely even doing anything. Right, so obviously there's something wrong. Uh, it's really, really disappointing. I mean, this thing is completely useless at this point. Uh, I spent for it and some accessories and things that ca that I've uh, put on it. I, you know, I'm into this thing for almost $2,000. One would expect I could at least drill a hole in something. Of course, I just got it bolted down yesterday. So I made a chip tray and that was a disaster of a project. But I, I got it in. And I bolted it all down, and of course, right after I did that, that's when I realized this. In order to diagnose it, there's a control board back here. You can see I've opened it up, but getting to it is a real pain in the ass because, well, it's bolted to the uh, bench right now, so I have to unbolt it and swing it around. There's something wrong with that control board. We'll see how Little Machine Shop's support goes. Uh, you know, I understand failures happen defects happen. When I first got it, I plugged it in and turned it on, you know, so it, at first glance it seemed fine. But I'm going to take this control board out of it right now. I have to unbolt it from the bench and swing it around. Just take a quick look at this board at the you know, let's just call it lack of quality standards and it's interesting here's a little discovery I made if you want to look at something you just grab a little hand loop like this and look at that so look at this that's probably a solder bridge there maybe down to that 320 or 332 resistor but look at the angle on all of these guys, right? I mean, these should be on here straight. And then, where's this guy at? Oh, look at that. Look at the offset of the legs on those. The legs off of that chip are way off to the right. They're supposed to be on those pads to the left. So there are a lot of things on here. I mean, look at this. <laughs> it's just... There was not much quality control going on here. I mean, just look at that. I mean, that's like turned 30 degrees from what it's supposed to be. Okay, so I found a service bulletin for this, which is kind of interesting. It talks about these three potentiometers. R3 here. Basically, it has no effect on speed regulation, so we can ignore it. 29 and 33, however, are interesting. 29, this one here, is the overload trip point. So basically, if we turn this counterclockwise, it will increase that trip point. So it sounds a lot like this is the one that I want to do. 33 is also for overload, but it is in ch uh, quick changes of power consumption. So if it goes from nothing to a lot uh, or something along those lines, um, it 
will it basically if you get a large change in load that's what this is for and this is kind of for max load now these are both coated with yeah, I think silicone something like that so they were probably coated at the factory to keep you from moving them but we'll just scrape that off of there and see if we can uh, move them before I do any motion at all on them I'll take a marker like a sharpie or something and draw across them so I know where the factory set points are so I'll clean those off and mark them then we're gonna go back out uh, in the shop reinstall this and see if making adjustments there uh, makes any difference all right I've already turned that pot here an eighth of a turn so we're gonna give it a try Well, I'd say that's no better because now it doesn't move at all. Well, there's an even bigger frustration. It was not working. Turn it on and off, on and off, nothing. So then I moved some wires to attach the ground clip and it started working. I didn't disconnect any. I didn't tighten any screws. I just moved some wires. It feels like maybe one of those headers, one of those terminal blocks, is maybe not soldered in properly or it's got broken solder. Joy. At any rate, let's see if this is any better. Eh, no. Move it another eight, try it again. Maybe? Didn't feel much different. We'll take a look. So it worked a couple of times, and now not working again I uh, this this thing is very very suspect I moved that pot now about three-eighths of a turn and it's blown the fuse now it, they could be completely unrelated that it's blown but that's what's happened I'm gonna see if I can find a, see if I have one of these fuses it is a Fast 5 amp 250 volt. So we'll see if I've got a fast 5 amp AC fuse. At this point, I really just don't have any trust in the electronics of this whole system. So I'm going to get a whole new drive for it and I'll replace all of these pieces while I'm at it. Since I'm taking both control boxes with me, so I'm going to take this one and the one that's on the back that has the motor control. That way I'll just keep this to run the new wires through. I really just have to disconnect this here. And that is simply this negative here, which comes all the way in and is screwed on up there. I'm not going to try pulling that eyelet through there, so just I just cut the eye off the other end and I'll pull the wire back through. There. So from the motor, we have the positive, negative, and ground. We're going to mount the new control on these same holes. 
it. Now let's go design some replacements. like it's pulled up on these corners actually a lot there not too unusual for something this big yeah you can see here how it's pulled clear up it looks like it did it to some degree on all four corners but I think that the overall mounting looks like it'll probably work. So what I'll do is I'll at least give it a try, see if I can mount it, see if it functions. It doesn't have to be overly pretty since it's just for me. If it works, I'll probably just use this. The print time on this was something like 16 hours. So I'm not sure that I'm really uh, looking to go through another 16 hours just to straighten those out. Plus I still have to print the box for the hand controls and I'm not certain I have enough filament left over here on hand to do uh, reprints of these. But we'll take a look. Well there we go. Surface finish is pretty terrible. I think I had the Z offset probably wrong. Maybe a wrong temperature. At any rate it's just for me. It'll be functional. We'll put it on. Well, we've got this guy sitting conveniently here on the bench. Let's take a look at the wiring on the control side. So this is our e-stop, power, potentiometer, and the tachometer output. So here's the tach output installed. It's a little easier to see. One of these LED drivers, basically it takes uh, 120, you know, 110 actually will go all the way up to 240 in, and it outputs 12 volt DC. So that's this guy down here. It's just mounted to the back, and it is connected up to this Hall Effect uh, sensor. And then this plug goes into the display here. So when I go to close it, I can just snap it in there. The potentiometer. I just ran three, I don't know, 20 gauge probably, blue wires here, potentiometer high, the wiper and low. Got a load wire that comes in, so it's primary, this is going to come from the source, basically the outlet, comes through our e-stop, then it goes to our switch, then out of the switch is switched power that one leg goes down, turns on the illumination for the switch, and then the other one goes down and it turns on that 12 volt supply. The other one runs all the way back to where the uh, driver board is. So basically, this is power that turns on the drive, goes through after the e-stop and the switch. Real simple. Then I've got three more wires that come through. These will come from the driver as well. We've got the armature, plus and minus, since it's a DC motor and the ground. Again, I still have to modify this slightly, make a little spot here for the high-low gear. If you're following along at home and using the designs, the STL that I'll push up, or at least put a link to, it's already shorter, so you don't need to do that modification. I'll just do that on this one. So really, I think we're ready to go out in the garage. Hopefully it's warmed up above 30 and we can uh, do the wiring on the other side let's head on out there so you can see right here it's impacting this but it only has to come back boy maybe an eighth of an inch not much so it's really close just have to do a little adjustment a little work with the flap disc 
took it right out. All right, got the wires hooked up there. Now we'll run these over to the control box on the back. All right, we're all wired up. It's actually real, real easy wiring. So we'll put the cover on this and uh, fire it up, see if it works. All right, so a few things to know here. One is the potentiometer, low and high. If you have those, I mean, you can reverse those. It just means whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise for the rotation of the potentiometer on the faceplate for fast or slow. I actually had it reversed when I first hooked it up. And so uh, fast was all the way to the left. Um, let's see, the armature plus and minus, that just changes the direction. So you can actually reverse those and it changes the direction of the motor. Uh, interestingly, the black on that motor is positive and white is negative. So when I hooked it up, it was reverse direction. But I swapped that and it's good. The last thing you need to know is these uh, five pots down here. These basically adjust the amount of current and the low and the high. So really what you need to look at is there's a min and a max. So this will adjust, basically you adjust it so that it, when the potentiometer is at its minimum, it stops, but just after you bring it off minimum, it starts spinning. Uh, maximum is whatever your max rate is. And then the current, this is the maximum amount of current. This will also affect the max speed as well, but you don't want this to be so high that it'll burn up your motor. I've got it at about, I don't know, a little bit over half. You can actually set this by putting a brake on it and measuring the current through the motor, but I'm just doing it by eye here. But at any rate, I've got it all adjusted. So we can turn it on. It rotates, does what it's supposed to do. Right now the RPMs aren't reading because the magnet was on this spindle. I had it just sitting on there. And because when I first hooked it up, the potentiometer was reversed. So it was on max speed and the magnet wasn't glued on yet. So as soon as I turned it on, it came up to max speed and that thing shot across the room. So I'll have to find another magnet. Um, I'll take a look and see if I've got something down in the office. But we can bring it up to speed. E-stop works. Everything seems to be working there. All right, I found another magnet here. I actually found a package of them, so. I haven't glued it on yet, so we'll uh, leave it there. But you can see that magnet has a polarity that has to match. So when you put it on, Make sure you test it first, because if it uh, reads zero, which basically is a negative number, and this can't uh, display a negative number, it just reads zero, you have to flip the magnet over. So all in all, if you've got one of these uh, Sieg mills, this is actually a really good upgrade. It's a much, much better motor drive, and it will allow me to upgrade the motor in the future. So that's all there is to it. Thanks for watching.